Hello everybody, I'm Miss Lisa. Welcome back to another episode of Watercolor for Kids. This is our second of eight class in our kids' art watercolor classes. And I'm going to show you today some more things about how to work with watercolor. Now last week we had this really fun intro. I showed you how to paint rainbow fish and some seaweed. This week I want to talk more about how to use watercolors. We'll go a bit slower and I also want to show you how to paint with the color white because we don't have any white in our watercolor set. So this is the set that I'm working with. It's the Crayola 8 pan watercolor set. You do not need to use the Crayola brand. This is the one I always use when I teach. And so this is the one that the kids in my classes are most familiar with. It has eight colors, brown, violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and black, black at the bottom there. And it has a lid here that you can use for mixing colors. It's actually a palette and a lid. So when it's shut, it works as a lid. When it's open, it works as a place to mix colors. You are also going to need a paintbrush, right? And I have my favorite brush here today. The brush that comes with your paints is also a very good brush, the one that comes with the Crayola paints. And if you don't have a really favorite paintbrush, um, no worries, just find any paintbrush and follow along. You will also need paper towels. Paper towels are very important when you do watercolor. You need them for cleaning up any accidental spills or for um, tapping your brush on to make sure it's clean, and I'll show you that process in a minute. It's also a good idea to have two containers of water. The first container we will rinse our brush with, and the second container we will rinse it again. So the first container will have the dirtiest water in it and the second container should be pretty clean and then by the time we've done two rinses with the brush in both containers of water we should have a very clean brush and that's important when you do watercolors. Today we're going to be also looking at using a white crayon and so if you have a white crayon, go ahead and grab a white crayon. If you don't, that's okay. We'll just um, not do that. You can just skip that part. And also, you probably want a pencil to draw with and maybe an eraser. You don't need to use an eraser, and I would prefer if you didn't. But if you really want to use an eraser, I'll show you a good way to use it. You will also need a piece of white paper, preferably watercolor paper, although it doesn't need to be watercolor paper. Watercolor paper is just a little bit thicker than regular paper, and it absorbs water while at the same time having a slight finish on it so the water doesn't absorb immediately. It will pool on top of the paper for a while, and then it will absorb. So watercolor paper is pretty cool. And then I'm going to show you what I want to do with you today. I'm going to show you how to paint daisies. Now daisies are tricky if you think about it because they require yellow paint, white, and then some green and blues behind. And we don't have white paint. We do have a white crayon we have white paper, and yellow is a tricky color to use because, as you probably know, it's very easy to get mixed up with other colors. And so I will show you how to avoid that as much as possible. I don't know about you, but I always get frustrated when my yellow gets mixed up with other colors. So I'll show you a way we can avoid that. Let's go ahead and start with our drawing. Now I went ahead and I did this with a 2B pencil 
because I wanted it to be dark enough that you could see what we were going to do. If um, I wouldn't actually draw it this dark for painting. I would do a very light drawing because the pencil will always show through a watercolor. And this is, you know, pretty dark. It's going to look like I've drawn it with a black pen almost and then painted in between. And that's okay if that's the look you're looking for. But I would prefer my paintings to be not uh, so linear with a pencil. And so I'll do another drawing now with a lighter pencil. But this is what I'm aiming for. This drawing here is just that you might not be able to see it so distinctly because I'm going to be using an HB pencil, which is lighter than the 2B that I used when I first drew this um, did this drawing. Okay, so to get started, let's do our border because we're painting. And so, like I was telling you last time, it's nice to have a border because that way your artwork stays inside the border and the paint doesn't get all over your tabletop. Hopefully it doesn't get all over you. And also it leaves you with a nice frame for your piece of artwork and that's I'll just show you again what we did with rainbow fish here so we drew the border first and we kept the painting inside the border and we ended up with this lovely white frame that goes around our painting at the end and also the paint stayed in the center right it didn't go all over the table so let's do that again I will remind you how to make a border we're going to start out with a dot in each corner of our paper and I like to make them about half an inch from the edge, half an inch from the bottom, half an inch from the top, and half an inch from the other side. And when I do my, when I draw my lines, I like to have my paper on a diagonal. It's just easier for me to draw that line when my paper is at a diagonal and not straight up and down. And the reason we put the dots there is because it gives our brain something to help our hand move towards. The brain and the hand are connected and, and it's just easier to do this if you see the dot. You know what you're aiming for. You do not need a ruler. This does not need to be a perfectly straight line. You do not need to measure. We're just doing it by estimation. Okay, so now I have four straight lines and together they make a rectangle and this is where I'm going to have my artwork inside the rectangle and the outer part is going to be a white frame. Now I also have my color wheel. Um, I showed you how to make a color wheel in the summer so if you want to make a color wheel you can go ahead and look back at some of the other um, painting classes that we had on our YouTube channel and you'll see the one about make your own color wheel. A color wheel is super fun and the reason it's important when you're painting, when you're learning to paint, is that it will help you learn about colors as well. If I was looking for yellow green, I wanted to use yellow green, but I only had yellow and I only had green, like here. I can look for the color that I want and I can see that the colors on either side when mixed together will make yellow green. If I know I want this color in my painting but I don't know what it's called, I can find that color and I can see that it's made with colors on either side. So I know if I mix orange and red together I should get this color and by the way its name is red orange. Okay. Now the other thing that the color wheel is very important for so it shows you the relationships between all the colors 
it also shows you which ones are, are opposite each other. So red and green are opposite each other on the color wheel. Colors that are opposite, like yellow-orange and blue-violet, they're called complementary colors. So yellow-green and red-violet are complementary colors, and yellow and violet are complementary colors. And this is important further on down the road when you're learning about color and painting because you'll be able to mix some really nice sort of browns and grays and even some near black colors by working in the complementary color range. So if you mix a little bit of red into green, you'll darken the green, you'll get a darker green. If you mix more red into the green, you'll get to a point where it's nearly black. It's very interesting how it works. And uh, orange and blue are my favorite mixture for getting some interesting browns. Okay, so that aside, we know the color wheel is super important. And if you like the relationships between colors, you definitely will want to check out that video. I love making color wheels. And I know my kids love to learn color wheels because I've taught that class so many times. Okay, so back to our drawing. How do we draw daisies? Let's take a look at this drawing here. We start out with kind of a, an oval shape. It's actually a circle. If we were looking straight down on a daisy, we would see that the center is a circle and it has the petals that go out evenly around that center circle. However, when we're looking at the daisy not straight down, it almost looks like an oval shape in the center and the petals on the far side of the daisy will appear shorter than the ones in the front. That's just how it's going to look. As you get more on top and look straight down on the daisy, then these petals will be appear as the same length as the other side because they are all the same length pretty much. But it looks different when you're viewing the daisy slightly from the side like in this view here, okay? So we're going to make the centers kind of an oval shape, and we're going to make the petals shorter on the far side of the daisy and longer on the front. And some of my daisies are facing inwards. Some of them are a view of more um, looking down on this daisy. And this one, you're kind of, it's kind of facing this direction. Okay, so if you have your daisies facing slightly different directions, it makes the painting more interesting than having them all facing the same way. So let's start out by making one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven oval shapes. And if you get to the point where you think this is going to be too much work to make seven, try three. Try three, maybe make one here, one here, and one here on your paper. But I'm going to do a drawing with seven daisies. And again, you may not be able to see my drawing because I'm not going to make it super dark. I'm starting out with the oval shapes. I want one here, I'll put one about here. And I'm gonna put one maybe here. Maybe one here, and one about here, and one here. I'm just sort of going according to what I have drawn the first time around. So I've got my oval shapes, and now I'm going to start putting the petals on those ovals. The ones on the back, again, are going to appear short. I'm just working around those oval shapes. Maybe I'll put one in there. And again.
Now you're going to see that this daisy, the petals on this daisy are actually going to run into the petals on this daisy. So I'll have to think which daisy is in front. And I've drawn this one already, so these petals are going to go behind. Okay, so this daisy's in front of this daisy. And now I'm going to do one here. Now this daisy's petals may, I guess not, almost overlapped this daisy, but not quite. I'm not being too careful about the shapes of the petals because it's going to change when I start painting. Okay, now this petal is going to be in the way, and this petal is going to be in the way of any other petals that I draw on this flower. So this flower is going to be behind this flower. You see that? By drawing the petals underneath the petals on this flower, it pushes this flower behind that one. Okay, I am going to draw some stems now. You may sort of come out from, if you can picture the center of the flower underneath the stem is going to um, attach. So I don't want my stem going over here when the center is over there. Kind of picture it coming from the center of the oval shape and downwards. I'm also going to put a few buds. Let's make them like so. Just so I remember to leave space for a few buds. Maybe one here. Okay, so my drawing is pretty much done. I'm not going to worry about any of the leaves. And I know that it's not going to show up very well, but you can see by looking at this one what it's going to look like over here. Now what I'm going to do Remember last week we were talking about painting fast and we used a lot of water to paint fast. Remember that when we did the water behind rainbow fish. So today we're going to be doing the same thing, but we're also going to be painting slow. We're going to paint fast and then we're going to let it dry a bit and then we're going to come back to it. Okay, so paintbrush into the water. Get your brush wet. And we're going to be, first of all, going into the yellow 
and we're not going to get it too, too wet because the yellow part is going to be careful and then we're going to do the, the green and the blue part behind. So I'm going to go into my yellow and go round and round and round in my yellow. And before you actually paint the yellow, if you're going to be not too happy about having pencil lines through the center of your flowers, you can erase the pencil lines in the center of your flowers. I'm just going to paint over them. But I know that I will see them when the painting is finished. I won't be able to go back and erase them, but it doesn't bother me. Okay, so there are my centers. And you can go ahead and do the same. You wanna get your yellow wet not too sloppy, just a little bit wet, because this part is more controlled. And then you're going to paint those oval shapes. I'll just do mine again while you're doing yours. All right, now we're going to resuspend the green and the blue. So I'm going to go into my green and go round and round and round. And then pick up a little bit more water and go into my green and go round and round and round. I'm going to pick up some water and go into my blue and go round and round and round. A bit more water. Okay, I think you can probably tell there's a lot of water in these two pans and the paint because I've gone round and round a few times. The pigment is well suspended. Now what I'm going to do is just put some water on my paper, but I'm going to be careful to go in between the petals of my daisy. And I'm going to be careful to stay within the border of my painting. So watch me first. I'm going to put water in here. You can see there's a little bit of blue in my paintbrush still. I'm going to go between the petals carefully. This is just painting with water. Now I'm going to take a little bit of my blue, put it in here. And because the paper's wet, it's going to help that paint move. I'm hoping it doesn't actually get pulled too far into the petals. I'm hoping it just stays outside of the petals. Depending on what kind of paper you have, 
you might find that the blue actually gets into the petal area. And if that happens, I'll show you a different way to keep those petals white. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is pick up a little bit of green and I'm going to continue keeping the paper wet and pulling the green down. So here there's a little bit of a, a greeny blue area. I'm still painting between the petals. I can see that this paper is not going to hold a lot of water, so I'm not going to be putting too much water only on the paper before I put the sloppy paint on. I'm just going to do the sloppy paint, but I'm going to be careful to not, um, not get it in the, the area of the petals. So I'm using lots of water and painting fast. And what I'm doing is I'm painting around the areas that I want to keep white. And this is called painting the negative shapes. So I'm painting around where the flower is. The flower is white. So I'm leaving the paper white where the flower actually is. And that's why it's called negative painting because you're actually leaving the area that you want white as the white of the paper. Instead of, if you were painting maybe a red daisy, you would use red paint. But because we don't have white paints, this is how watercolors are normally done. Some people use white paints, but most people that do watercolor use the white of the paper as their white color. And it makes sense, right? I mean, if your paper's white already, you don't need to put white paint on. So see how I'm going around the petals and in between them. And I'm not worried too much about my green and my blue mixing on my paper because it's just a background. It might be sky, it might be grass, it might be more daisy plants behind it. I'm not too worried. And I can see that this paper is probably not the best paper for putting too much water on it because you see how it's pulling out across the border there? So your painting might look different than mine, and this painting I'm sure will look different than another one that I did on if I used proper watercolor paper. It would look quite different, but still we're getting a feel for how negative painting works. If I was painting any kind of white flower, I would paint around that flower and just leave the white of the paper showing. I think I'll put some green down here.
I'm still using quite a bit of water. And you don't have to use a lot of water. You can actually do this with less water in a more controlled way. But the background is often an area where you don't need to use a lot of time and effort and detail because it's not the main part of the painting. The main part of the painting are these beautiful white daisies. And so that's the part that we're going to be spending our attention. I mean, we're not actually painting them. We're painting around them. But we want the attention to be focused on the flowers. And I'm going to be doing some stems and leaves as well. But we're going to do that after this first layer dries. I think one of the nice things about watercolor painting is that you do paint, you can paint rather quickly and it, it feels quite liberating. It makes you feel kind of free to be able to paint quickly. Now this is the part where the petals were kind of crossing over being a little bit careful, but still painting rather quickly. The paper makes so much difference. There are so many different sorts of paper, watercolor paper, they have slightly different characteristics. Some of them have very different characteristics. And if you ever get serious about learning a watercolor, you can spend a long time just working with different papers and feeling the way the paint moves on them. I spent a really long time thinking about paper and a really long time thinking about paints, and a really long time thinking about brushes. But when I'm working with you today, I'm not showing you all those things because that would take so long. The next really important thing I want to show you is how to take care of your brush. And I'm nearly done with this watery part. We're almost ready to do a little bit of a rinse. The blue is now very dark because it's been sitting around with that little bit of water in it. Just gonna pull some of that color along. Let's have a little bit more green here. Okay, so at this point, you should have some shapes that look pretty much like daisies. And if you need to reinforce some of those, um, re-emphasize some of the bits in between the petals, you can go ahead and do that. 
But then what I want to do is show you what to do with your brush. Okay, so now we've got a brush that's got paint in it, and we want to rinse it. Rinse it in the first container of water. Just tap very gently on the side. Rinse it in the second container. And touch it on a paper towel. And if you see no color coming out on your paper towel, then you know that your paintbrush is clean. And we're just going to set it aside for a little bit. Never leave your paintbrush in the water because what happens is the bristles will bend and then eventually they'll break off and you can't use your paintbrush anymore. So never leave your paintbrush in the water. Always rinse it and then set it on a paper towel or somewhere else to dry. Now your paint tray will have wet paint in it. and uh, Some people will sort of dab them all out with paper towels. I don't do that because if you just leave that paint tray by itself, just leave it alone, eventually the water evaporates from the pans and it'll be just like, you know, when you first started out and all the colors were solid and then you just go ahead and resuspend the colors that you want and start again. You don't really need to dry out your paints. Just set them aside somewhere where they won't get knocked over and they'll be ready to go. Okay, now what we're going to do is leave this painting to dry for a little bit, and I will see you again soon. Hello everybody, I'm Miss Lisa. Welcome back. Is your painting dry? I think mine's pretty dry. Okay, mine looks like this now. And if, if your painting feels cool to the touch, it's not quite dry yet. Okay, that's one way to tell if it's dry. If you touch it with your hand and it still feels cool, then you have to wait a little while longer. But you can always stop the video and come back tomorrow and watch the rest of it. Mine is dry now, and so I'm going to continue with the painting, but you can watch this part later if your painting is still wet. What we're going to do now is we are going to be painting on top of our painting and that's why we want this layer to be dry because as we know from doing the rainbow fish and the um, parts of the green and blue when both colors are wet there's going to be mixing on the paper and I want the pieces that I'm going to paint now like the stems and the leaves to not mix with the background. And I'm not, what am I going to do here? I've got only one green, right? So if I put green on top of green, it's not going to show up very well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a new green. I'm going to put it there in the lid. And I'm going to make a darker green by mixing a little bit of red into it. Red and green are the complementary colors I was talking about earlier. And a mixture of a little bit of red into green will darken that color. So first of all, I have to resuspend my green pigment. And I want to get a fair amount of paint. And I'm going to use this ridge here on my palette and gently draw my paintbrush over that ridge. And you see how the paint just sort of comes out of my paintbrush? I can pick up a little bit more paint and again, just run gently over that ridge to release the paint. I'm just going to do a little bit more. So I've got more water in my brush and I'm going round and round in that green. I've got paint now in, in the tip of my paintbrush and I'm going to gently pull it over the ridge in my palette and it releases the paint. Now I'm going to pick up a little bit of red. Now because I'm changing colors, I want to rinse in my second water here so I don't get some green into my red in my paint box because I want to keep that red clean. So I'm going to go into my red, round and round and round. Pick up a little bit of red and I'm going to mix it into the green. And see how it darkens the color? This is green without the red, and this is green with the red. So 
So now I can use this color and I can paint a stem. See how that works? I'm going to paint a little bud here. Remembering that I don't want to go over the white of my petals, right? Stem here. Stem here. Here. I can't remember where the buds were going to be. One here, I think. Yeah. If you get really tired of waiting for your painting to dry, you can ask somebody to help you um, dry it with a with a um, a blow dryer, a hair dryer. Just don't don't get it too hot. Use it on a low setting. Now for the leaves, I'm just going to pull some paint like this. Just a little indication. Make up some more of that dark green. When you go into the red, make sure you don't get too much water in the red because you don't want to dilute your green paint. You just want to darken it with the red. Look at that color. What a difference. It almost looks like a brown right now because there's quite a lot of red in it. And that works too. I could put more green in it at this point and it would become more of a dark green again. But I like having variation. So this, this green is almost red. It's a ready green color, but that's fine. Now I want to go in between Remember how we did the negative painting of the petals? Now I'm going to do some, also some leaf shapes by taking some of the darker greens. I'll take some green and mix it into here to turn it back into a green. And I'm going to make some negative shapes. I'm going to paint around some of these petals, I mean the, the leaves, to make it interesting. You can add a lot of interest by painting around things and just giving the feeling that maybe there's something else going on. We've already got the green on the paper and you have to do this pretty fast because you want your first layer to stay dry, the one that we dried already. So this paint layer has to go on fairly quickly. You don't want to keep rubbing the paints together. Just let it sit there and dry by itself. And I can go around some of these petals to make them look more emphasized. Come into the center of these daisies. Tidy them up a bit. There's usually a bit of shadow in between the petals, right?
when I paint landscapes and flowers, I end up using a lot of the dark green colors because I think they really add to the painting. I'll show you how to mix some other kinds of greens when I do a landscape class, which I'll do soon. Watercolor landscape. It's a lot of fun. So again, I'm just going in between some of these petals. And I'll leave some feeling that there might be some other leaves or shapes behind. Maybe some grass down here. I used to be really confused by the color green because so many things are green and there's only one color of green in the paint box. But after I made my color wheels, I realized that you can mix a whole bunch of different kinds of greens. And that's so important when you're doing landscapes because the last thing you want is a landscape that's all the same color of green. We know that there are so many different kinds of greens in nature. And when you look out over a field and you look and you see the trees in the background and you see the yellow green grass in the foreground, you just know that there's so many other colors, variations of green. And we're going to talk about those another time. So I'm still going around the petals. I don't want to get paint in my white petals. So I hope this is kind of looking like there's different kinds of leaves and plants and things in the background. I'm going to leave this part up here less detailed because it's more in the distance. So I'll go ahead and just emphasize the space between the petals up here. As you go into the distance, you see less detail. So we don't have to worry too much about making shapes up here. Just want to clean up some of the areas 
between the petals by adding a little bit more green, give them a little bit more definition. I should probably do a little bit of something up there in the sky because my blue was sort of too wet for the paper, I think. It was giving me not quite the result that I wanted. So I'll just go ahead and put a little bit more blue up here too. And because the blue is dry underneath, it's not going to run into the white in the same way that it did before. And now I'm just going to dampen the edge here and pull it up so it kind of blends with the lighter blue behind. And same thing on the other side here. This daisy, you can see how the blue ran into the petals because the paper was a little bit wetter than it could handle, but that's okay. A lot of times with watercolor, things just happen and you just kind of either accept that or you think, how can I change it? And I just wanted to add a little bit more blue so it's not quite so washed out up here. However, I can leave this part lighter because, again, variation is good. And also, maybe it's a cloud. Maybe what we're looking at is a cloud right there. It kind of looks like a cloud to me. It looks like a cloud that's going to drop a lot of rain. And I don't want to have this blue outlining my petals, so I'm going to bring it into the painting. And I'm going to add a little bit of green here, blend that in. Sometimes when you paint, you just have to stop. You have to know when it's time to stop. And I think this one is just about done. All right, there we have white daisies in a field. Now, before I finish, I just wanted to go over one more thing because I was telling you that if your paper isn't doing quite what you want, uh, and I was having that problem up here, I was seeing the blue was coming into the white and the green was going into the white down here, there is another way to get around that, and that is to use a white crayon. So if I, I'll just do it on one of these daisies, but I'll give you the feel for what happens. I'm going to color the white with my white crayon. And when you do this with a white crayon, this is, this is the resist technique that I've talked about before. If you haven't heard me talking about it much, you have to go back and look at some of the other videos that we have on our YouTube site. And a lot of my watercolor classes, I will be using either pastel or crayon resist in some way. I do use it quite a lot in kids classes because it's an easy way to keep something white. Now when you do this you have to press down pretty hard 
because you want the wax from the crayon to resist the water in the paint. So what I'm doing basically is protecting the paper. I'm protecting the white by drawing over it with a white waxy crayon. And it also works with a white oil pastel because the oil in the pastel also protects the white of the paper. We know that oil and water don't mix. And so it keeps the paint, the water and the paint from sticking to anything that's covered in pastel, in oil pastel, not soft pastel, not chalky pastel. It has to be oil pastel. But here I've used white crayon and I still have to paint the center of my flower yellow. Now I'm going to go into this nice clean water here because I'm using yellow. I'm always really careful when I use yellow that I don't accidentally get another color into it. So here's my very clean paintbrush. And I can tell it's clean because if I touch it to a paper towel, I don't see any color coming out. Nice and clean. So I'm going to take some of that clean water and I'm going to go into my yellow and go round and round and round in the yellow. And then I'm going to come back to my flower and I'm going to paint that part yellow. And the yellow sticks to the paper because there's no crayon in the yellow part. I only put it on the white petals. Now I'm going to take some blue and I'm not going to paint the whole thing. I'm just going to show you with a little bit of blue. Let's get that paint sloppy. A little bit more water in it. Oops. That sloppy paint. Okay, so now when I paint over this, can you see how paint doesn't stick to my flower because of the white crayon? But I don't want it to get close to the yellow because you know what's going to happen. The blue is wet and the yellow is wet and they're going to mix. And I don't want that to happen. So I'm purposely not painting right up to the yellow part because that yellow is still wet. So you can see that I can really get a nice white flower and I can get nice blue sky. And my center of the flower is staying yellow because I have not touched the blue to the yellow part. Now, the very last thing I can do is take a tissue and just very gently, I don't want to do it too roughly because I'm going to pick, um, pick up some of the blue as well. I'm just gently going to touch the white petals to take off the excess blue. And there you go. So this is another way to keep your whites white. You can either paint around them like this, and again, this is called negative painting, or you can use a white crayon or a white pastel and then paint over it and just blot the little extra bit of paint that sits on top of the white. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that class. Uh, you learned a lot today. I am, you can go ahead and rinse your brush out properly, right? Rinse it once, rinse it twice, touch it to the paper towel to make sure that no color is coming out, and then just rest it near your paint box. Your paint box, we're just going to keep it open and let it dry. You can move it to somewhere where it won't get accidentally knocked over. And when it's dry, I can close the lid. I'll probably wipe the dark green off of the lid first with a wet paper towel, and then I'll close it up and it will be all ready for next time. So that's it for today. Please stay safe, wash your hands well, stay inside, enjoy your art, 
and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.